you for this kind introduction. And thank you also for, thank you, the organizers of this conference for inviting me, especially to Mark Dunfried, for extending the invitation. I also want to thank Professor Dr. Bernhard for his insightful presentation on the European Court of um, Human Rights. Um, I will focus my brief presentation on a different kind of court tonight, um, the International Criminal Court. And since um, I'll try to be brief because we still have a panel discussion coming up, um, I will, however, have to speak a bit sl more slowly than I usually would because the baby's kicking at my lungs. So <laughs> I hope I can, I can keep my breath. <laughs> so I have been asked to set the stage for the subject of tonight's panel, which will deal with um, peace building and uh, in international relations and human rights in this setting. And in, in order to introduce um, you all to the subject, I will attempt to illustrate the current debate surrounding the impact of the International Criminal Court on international peace negotiations by dealing with the subject or the example of the conflict in Darfur, Sudan. As the International Criminal Court begins to act upon its agenda, the debate concerning the relationship of peace versus justice or peace and justice in the international diplomatic relations between states as well as states and international organizations such as the UN has reached a new high. The court was founded in 1989 at 1998 and has begun investigating the gravest international crimes in five situations, which is the, Congo, the Democratic Republic of the Congo Central African Republic, Uganda, Kenya, and Sudan. The first accused were arrested and some have even surrendered themselves and a few trials have gone underway. When the ICC issued its arrest warrant against Sudan's president, Omar al-Bashir, last year, those who strove hard to establish the court hailed that, that day as a breakthrough for the cause of international justice. Others, however, feared that this arrest warrant would lead to a deepening of the conflict, more loss of human life, and, even, and an even dire humanitarian crisis. Organizations such as Doctors Without Borders and others were partially expelled from Darfur a few weeks after, or pretty much immediately after the arrest warrant was released. So these fears seem to have been realized. Not few diplomats, said that the arrest warrant would infringe upon the West's effort to bring peace to Darfur and to some more importantly, to peace in the south of Sudan. There, the peace agreement between North and South Sudan, which may pave the way to independence of the South next year, is dependent on Bashir's support and his will to hold back his armies. However, those who have criticized the court for causing even more harm, risk taking a short-sighted view, not only with respect to the conflict in Darfur as such, but especially regarding the long-term positive impact the International Criminal Court can have in bringing peace to the region. When evaluating the impact of the arrest warrant, you have to take into account Sudan's long history of impunity which has caused constant and recurring cycles of violence and um, has caused a high death toll among civilians. History shows that the absence of real consequences for such unlawful behavior has likely encouraged the government and its officials in Khartoum to believe that they can continue waging war against their own civilians in Darfur as they have done before in the south of Sudan. More than two million civilians are estimated to have died during the conflict, and four million people were displaced. As in Darfur, years after, the Sudanese government used so-called scorched earth tactics. 
Ethnic militia were a key part of these campaigns against civilians. They were allowed to burn villages, loot cattle, kill, injure, and capture the Noor and Dinka civilians to be used as forced labor. The government also undertook extensive aerial bombing raids and launched offensives with rebels on horseback. As in Darfur, civilians were denied access to humanitarian aid by the government, which cost tens of thousands of lives. Amnesty International has documented these crimes for years, and this also includes, includes the crimes in South Sudan. As in, the South, South, as in South Sudan, the conflict in Darfur emerged when local populations called for a power-sharing agreement with the central government in Khartoum. From 2003 on, the government pursued a strategy that is strikingly similar to that which it, which it pursued in the south of Sudan. The lack of consequences and the lack of international pressure to achieve accountability for those crimes sent the message that there would be no consequences for using these same tactics in Darfur. The Janjaweed militias were provi provided with weapons and free reign to target civilians. They were officially part of the army. Some of the same personnel which had organized the offenses against civilians in South Sudan were now organizing the atrocities in Darfur. As in South Sudan, the objective was to destroy any bases of real support for the rebels seeking autonomy from Khartoum. In the peace talks for this conflict, which led to the comprehensive peace agreement, provisions on accountability for international crimes and grave human rights violations were not included, nor were these included in peace talks concerning Darfur, and ongoing atrocities were not even mentioned. International negotiators demonstrated that there would be no consequences for these atrocities. Their goal was simply to quickly strike a deal. As the atrocities in Darfur reached a scale of violence, which the international community could hardly continue ignoring, the Security Council took a bold step. It referred the case to the International Criminal Court for further investigation. Next to the arrest warrant against Bashir, the ICC issued arrest warrants against senior mil militia leaders and members of the government. Recently, one of the militia leaders actually even surrendered himself voluntarily to the court. However, with respect to Darfur, the Sudanese government has maintained its policy of impunity. Nothing is being done on a local level. There is talk of implementing a national tribunal, but none of this has really come to, come to, come to play. Um, and uh, the laws and for this, this national tribunal are uh, quite, flaw, uh, quite full of flaws. Meanwhile, the conflict widened to neighboring countries and became a major security problem for the entire region. Amnesty International, as well as other human rights organizations, is convinced that the ICC is the single greatest hope for lasting peace in Sudan. With, this, with the support of the international community, it could prosecute those responsible for years of war and, dest and destruction and pave the way for a democratic and peaceful transition. If Bashir and others responsible for waging the war in Sudan were held accountable, this would not only end the cycle of violence, but also would end one of the most ruthful, ruthless dictatorships in Africa. Even though Bashir has not been arrested yet, the Sudanese government has conceded that the arrest warrant has already impaired his capability to act as a head of state. He is unable to travel to most Western countries, to all Western countries, and even those who are not state parties to the Rome Statute would not invite him. Unfortunately, some states are less inclined to cooperate with the court, and the most unfortunate recent case is Kenya. 
Additionally, examples from other conflicts show that bold moves by international prosecutors and judges have helped peace processes rather than undermined them. The indictment of Charles Taylor and Slobodan Milosevic served to marginalize and stigmatize these men, leading to their political decline and eventually their arrest, which cleared the path to lasting peace in West Africa and the former Yugoslavia. There also is a rising number of cases where ICC investigations and investigations by other courts have had a deterrent effect. In the Ivory Coast, for example, the announcement by the UN Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide that the situation could be referred to the International Criminal Court led to messages of restraint aired through public radio channels where before there had been constant incitement to violence. This was an important factor in allowing the situation to quiet down more quickly. Thus, it can be argued that the ICC and other international courts not only can not only help br to bring peace to a conflict and ongoing hostilities, but can also have a deterring effect. Bringing peace to these regions is not only in the interest of the many victims, but also in the interest of the international community and human humanitarian aid agencies investing an enormous amount of money and personnel in dealing with the consequences of these crimes. One important example is our engagement in, in, in the Congo, for example. Germany and other states have sent troops and are, is investing massive, massive amounts of resources to hold free and fair elections, but we're not going at the root causes of the problems in this country. Understanding this positive impact the ICC can have on peace is vital for future diplomatic negotiations on peace deals. The idea that impunity for the worst crimes is not only illegal under international law, but also detrimental to sustainable peace must therefore become an inherent part of any peace negotiation effort coordinated by individual states or the UN. I'll leave it at that for now, and if there are questions, um, I'll be happy to try and answer them. Thank you. We can also do it on the panel later. I'm We, um, we'll no perhaps questions. take a couple of questions <laughs> before we move to the panel discussion. Okay. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question for Dr. Von Braun, please raise your hand. Thanks. My name's Craig. I'm a law and politics student uh, in the UK. Um, thank you. I, I, this is a dichotomy that interests me a lot, um, the question of whether peace and justice has to be a choice. Um, I think one of the challenges in the system is when one of the challenges, perhaps you can comment on this, is that the ICC right now is sometimes being used as part of a political process. For example, in, uh, in Uganda, uh, where the president uh, asked for, referred the case uh, of uh, the LRA to the ICC, and several years later, when attempting to implement <coughs> a peace agreement, tried to uh, get the, uh, trying to de-refer it, basically. Um, so how does the connection work with when politics factor in, and perhaps I'd also love to hear your thoughts on some of the challenges. One of the one large criticism of the ICC is that it's not able to take account of political uh, contextual differences between cases, and particularly sequencing, and that issuing the indictment in the middle of the conflict potentially removes a large incentive to move towards peace. Yeah, two interesting, very important questions. Um, at the moment, it seems, since the ICC has ta taken up its work um, and is trying to pro progress and trying to move through its investigations and um, actually bringing some of them to trial, um, there is, yeah, there's, it, it's bound to have a political influence in all of the situations it's dealing with. Um, since the crimes that are being dealt with are of such enormous capacity, they're so, so, 
they've they've all um, affected the, the foundations of the societies where they were committed. And in all of the cases, they were committed by um, in a systematic fashion. So you have either a militia group such as the Lord Resistance Army, but you also have an have a government that has played a certain role also during a conf conflict. So it's bound to always be extremely political. It's also the, the single most problematic, well, it's the, sing it's, it's the greatest problem the court faces as well. Um, in the Uganda case, um, the behavior of the, uh, the government was first, I agree, quite positive. They referred the case to the court. They said, please, court, do this. We are, we are not unable, but we are unwilling to deal with it ourselves. Um, at that time, um, organizations such as Amnesty um, supported this move. Um, normally, we would say the national jurisdictions should deal with these crimes. But, um, and especially a country like Uganda, which, is, which would be able to deal with them but there's a security problem and a, and, a, and a political problem. So it was a bold and positive move. Now, um, a few years later, the Ugandan government is not <laughs> dealing with the, is not able to deal with the problem as such and is trying to, has, has in, a, in a military sense, driven the LRA out of the country it's gone into the Congo, it's gone into the south of Sudan, all these, all these factors. But the problem hasn't been solved for the, the north of Uganda. Um, and it's also backtracking, and that's probably the most important reason for its backtracking, is that, of course, the, the, the court is not bound to the mandate that the state has given to it. It is, it is an independent institution. And once the prosecutors look into a situation, they will, they will look at the situation, and that's what they're expected to do. So of course, there's fear on part of the government, and especially its president, that the, um, the, it'll not only look at the crimes of the LRA, but also at the crimes the government may have committed. So these are problems that will always arise because the crimes are in such a political context, are committed in such a political context. I don't think we'll, be, we'll ever see a situation where that, these kind of in, attempts at interference or uh, will, will, will subside. It'll always be a difficult, difficult road that the prosecution will have to take in trying to find its way through its investigations. Um, we see that on a national level with big trials in organized crime or big national corruption trials it'll always be difficult once political actors are involved. Um, on the question of issuing an indictment in the middle of an ongoing conflict, my personal opinion is that we have cases in, in the past, such as Charles Taylor, um, that have shown once prosecutors decide that they have enough evidence to bring a case to trial, um, why should they hold back, especially if you are, con if, if the person that you're investigating has had years and years of time to bring um, himself into a, a truly useful and, and, and sustainable peace process. Charles Taylor has had many, many chances before he was actually arrested, um, and he, um, he signaled to the international community on a number of occasions, oh, I'm ready for the next peace process. Please invite me to the next summit. I'll, uh, you know, and then the, the next summit came. All the international diplomats came there and said, oh, yes, finally. And then uh, he signed some agreement, went back, and the war continued. And this happened a number of times. And you know, at some point, enough is enough. And when he was arrested, the sky didn't fall. It just didn't. What happened is that he was taken out of the game, and this taking him out of the game helped a peaceful and sustainable democratic transition in Liberia and also in Sierra Leone. So that's for me, it's one of the most positive examples that 
we need international law and the establishment of the rule of law in international conflicts. Yeah. There's a question up there. Thank you. Uh, I am Yaqut from Sudan. Uh, my father born in Darfur. I live in Khartoum, but uh, I was in Darfur be before two weeks ago. Uh, I think that in Darfur there is conflict and war and problem of uh, development, but there is no genocide or real genocide. Uh, also, I have a question. What is the main role of the UN mission in, in Darfur and the NGOs uh, if is there real genocide in Darfur? Okay. Uh, the second question, why the ICC uh, don't talk about the genocide in Palestine and the, about Israel and something like that? Why does just they talk about Sudan and genocide mm -hmm. in Darfur? And, Thank you. Okay, um, did I understand you correctly? You said you don't think there's genocide in Sudan. That's what you said? Just, uh, I, 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 mean, I mean, I mean uh, there's mission for the UN uh, <laughs> monitor the, the, the situation in Darfur and uh, there are many NGOs in Darfur and right. work in Darfur. If there is genocide, why the, arm, the armed force of, of Sudan, uh, why don't kill the, the NGO's uh, employer? Okay. Um, whether their genocide was committed in Sudan or not is a hotly debated question. And um, we have um, investigations of the International Criminal Court going in that direction as well. We, they're investigating three sets of crimes. Um, and the last arrest warrant, which was um, issued for Bashir, also included genocide. So there, we don't have a judgment on the fact yet, in the legal sense, that there is genocide in, in that there was genocide in Sudan. We have, we have signs that something like genocide may have occurred. But as a lawyer myself, I'm, you know, as long as the court hasn't issued a judgment on that, I would al always argue we have signs of genocide, but we don't have, we don't have a judgment on it yet. So, and, and since it's such a, such a grave crime, um, I'm always a bit reluctant to state this was definitely already genocide. Yeah, we, we just, we, we don't know that yet. Um, the mission of the UN in, in, in Darfur is, is a peace is, is a peace building mission, um, trying to keep the parties separate, trying to secure and safeguard the civilians. Um, it's funded by the UN and uh, staffed mainly by the African Union, um, and it's having great problems. Why? Because the international community is not putting enough effort in, into it. Um, so we'll have to see where that goes. Um, it fits into the whole picture that we have uh, not found a good international solution for solving the conflict in Darfur yet. Problem, why does the ICC deal with, this, with the situation in Sudan and not other situations? You have to look at each situation to answer that question. Um, the, the, the Rome statute gives the court um, jurisdiction in certain situations. In Sudan, we have the referral by the Security Council. Sudan itself is not a state party. Um, Israel is not a state party. And the question that relates to Palestine is that we don't have a state. And the, the prosecutor is looking into that case. And he's looking into ways of uh, it's evaluating the jurisdiction, so he's, he, he's got his eye on it. Um, but we don't have um, a jurisdictional link from the Rome Statute. You need, to be, you need to have ratified the statute, or you have to have a different trigger, such as the Security Council. So all, this, all the other situations in the world 
that, um, such as Chechnya and Russia, or also the conflict between Russia and Georgia. We've got tons and tons of situations. At the moment, we have a limited jurisdictional um, capacity. We've got 100, I think, 14 states which ratified the statute till now. It's a high number, but we don't have universal implementation yet. But that's one of the most important goals. Yeah. Um, Dr. Von Braun, I think, as far as I'm aware, you're the first speaker to have spoken whilst having their lungs kicked uh, <laughs> during the presentation. So we're particularly <laughs> grateful. Um, on a more serious note, thank you for your speech thank and for fielding those questions, and we look forward to hearing more from you in the panel discussion. So if everyone could join me in showing their appreciation for Dr. Thank you.